I am Jack Donovan, and I am the Herald of Lightning. Lo, I teach you Superman. All right. You are listening to or watching PH2T3R, the Journal of Solar Culture. And I'm here with my uh, co-host, my co-star, really, uh, C.B. Robertson, who is author of many fine books. And uh, tonight we are going to talk about uh, the Superman or the Overman or the Ubermensch. Uh, the, the overhuman, uh, the, they, they translate it in so many different ways. And that's part of the confusion. That's where the confusion begins. Uh, you know, but, uh, but yeah, we have, uh, you know, we've been talking about, uh, we've been reading Thus Big Zarathustra in the order of fire for the past uh, month. Um, you know, we're just doing it little by little because it's so much to unpack. There's so many little stories in it, a uh, written as parables. It's, uh, it's been fun for me to introduce to people because it's one of my favorite books uh, in terms of, you know, I, as a writer, the balls of being, I'm going to write in the voice of a prophet and write in parables is uh, I think the most exciting. That's I, I aspire to just write in parables someday. Like that would be, <laughs> that's the, there's so much in them uh, and there's so much to unpack, but um, obviously the story of Buspec Zarathustra and, that my intro at the beginning, because we know that I have fun with my intros uh, at the beginning, the opening sequence where the clouds are going across the uh, the lake there, uh, the very first thing was in a um, time-lapse photography, that is actually Sils Maria. I don't know how there's stock footage of that, but there is. And Sils Maria is the place where I was going to go to in 2020 because it's where Nietzsche wrote Thus Spake Zarathustra. It's the, he walked around that lake all the time. <laughs> and so I was like, I found that, I was like, that, that's literally the perfect, you know. And what I didn't know is that, uh, that uh, you know, also Spock Zarathustra or Thus Spake Zarathustra, that piece of music that we just listened to that's famous from 2001 a Space Odyssey. Um, but that piece of music that, the part that we listen to, which is the famous part, there's other parts of it. It's a tone poem that goes through other, some of the other ideas in the book. But the part that we're listening to is actually called Sunrise. So it's at the beginning. So I was like, oh, so perfect. <laughs> and one of my favorite things about uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra is that it actually starts with Nietzsche speaking to the sun. And, uh, and basically he's telling the sun, Basically, what I say about it in solar idealism, like it has so much overflowing energy that it has so much to give. And then he says, "Well, I I have all this wisdom because I've gone to the, I've taken my ashes to the mountain, and now I've I'm filled with you know wisdom like a bee with too much honey. And then I want to go back down to the mountain and and take my fire down to the valley and give his wisdom to the world. And so that's how it opens up." And then that's when he goes to the village and introduces the Superman. And it, I thought it would be an interesting topic for a show because Ubermensch conjures up a lot of things in people's mind. People who've never read, most people have never read Nietzsche, but everyone knows that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Like, I mean, what it's like a Kanye song or something. I don't, but, uh, <laughs> you know, Bach and also from Carrie Underwood, I think. <laughs> Yeah, like everybody's used it. Nobody, no, none of those people probably ever read Nietzsche, and uh, it's just a, it's a popular quote, and and so many other will to power, so many ideas that come from Nietzsche, but Ubermensch, you know, has its own thing. Uh, you know, some people say Superman, but when you say Ubermensch, people have an idea of what that is. You know, even if they've never read Nietzsche, because I I was almost thinking about it is like, is it almost like an onomatopoeia or something like? If you say something in German and you think it means super something, is it do you automatically picture like some like super jacked like a uh, superhuman dude that's like blonde and is uh, I, I brought up uh, uh, Dolph Lundgren in the email that I that I mentioned it because I think that's a you know this uh, this this blonde person that's like better than everyone else and he's just gonna crush you um, and I think that's when you're a young man I think that's 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 what the overmensch seems like it should be. 
Uh, it's this Superman that's beyond all men, and he's better than he's everything that you're trying to be, but you're not like in a Fight Club kind of way. Uh, you know, it, it's something bigger than you. But that's not really what it means. That's not really what Nietzsche means by it. And I think the more that you dig into that, it's not a man who's bigger and stronger and better and faster than you. Uh, it's not. It's not like the super evolved like uh, superhuman. I also brought up. You know, I, I think people probably think of it as being almost maybe like uh, like the engineers in Prometheus, you know, because they're super evolved human beings beyond human. And, you know, that's what it really means is is beyond human. And, and that's some of the translations that they've come up with is closer to that. Uh, they like to make the point that it, mensch doesn't technically mean man, it means human even though it sounds like it means man. And uh, I, it seems to me that they use it in the same way that we use man in the, in the grand man. The way we, M. Yeah, the way that we've used it up until like, you know, the mid 20th century. But we'll assume that they're right because I don't know enough German to like criticize that. But uh, still the sense that when you see the, the way that Nietzsche writes about women, he's not talking about that. <laughs> like, <laughs> he even says in the Wikipedia article of all things about Zarathustra, I mean about uh, the, the Ubermensch, that uh, the goal of the female is, is to give birth to the Ubermensch, and like that is that is how she that is her value is to is to is to bring it about. And Which I was surprised that that was the interpretation on Wikipedia. That sounds like a Dune reference. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I mean, Dune <laughs> I mean would be referencing around, him. Yeah, yeah, Dune would be referencing right. him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, the 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 pop culture reference that comes to mind is mm -hmm. um, uh, what's the band? Uh, Rammstein put out yes. this song called Deutschland uh, fairly mm -hmm. recently. I want to say like 2019, 2020, okay. um, along with a music video. And it was it had all this historical stuff worked into its um the videography as well as the the lyrics um and it, it describes this kind of love hate relationship it's like i want to love you but i want to hate you in relation to german history german mm -hmm. speaking to itself and it has this this repetition repetitious line of like uber hebrew uber legen uber nehmen uber geben uber ashen uber fallen and i think later on it says uber mensch um but not within that uber and it has this almost dismissive uh or else guilty attitude with just the prefix uber as like a, a notion of superiority that one is supposed to be ashamed of ever having thought and it feels like that has become attached to the idea of the superman in some way right and even the the cursory reading i was doing about it today uh, had to do with the idea that even the correct translation of that is more like a beyond rather than a over like a you know, like a super mm. you know like a, like a superior uh it's yeah. more of a beyond uh you know and and so and i can't really speak to that obviously i don't have the german background but Hilariously, I think that that's when you were talking about, you know, because obviously Germans have some some guilt issues about about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they have very, I mean, and the one they either do or they really don't. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think mainstream Germans, a lot of them have have some guilt issues uh, uh, about things that obviously they never did in the way that you know they were they weren't present for that. Uh, but. I really think the message, as I was reading through this again today, uh, some of the passages about Zarathustra, is an anti-guilt message. More than anything, more than, almost more than anything, it's it's a. Uh, as I was really examining it uh, recently, the things he says about Zarathustra and and the critique he's making of Christianity is very much that it's a guilt-based religion. And I think that Christians might argue with that, but all the rest of us see it. <laughs> like everybody's like, well, it's a pretty guilt-oriented religion, you know, like a, a original sin, you know, like all, all these things that like, uh, that really translated, I would say that translated into the woke very well. 
you know, like things, you know, like you will, no matter what you do, you will always be a racist. No matter what you do, you will always be a sexist. No matter what you do, you right. will always be a sinner. The, the, all the, the sin is, the, the sin is, so to speak, structural. Yes. <laughs> it's intersectional. <laughs> intersectional sin. Uh, like, they, they should, they should yeah. bring that up. But yeah, yeah, it's, and so, but Nietzsche was really, the, the passages that talk about the Ubermensch specifically are about like not really apologizing for being alive. Well, right. And he, 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 he speaks of, of man as something to be overcome. And yeah. for years, um, I loved Nietzsche, but I had two gripes with Nietzsche. One was the will to power, which I still have a bit of a gripe with. Um, but two was the Superman or the Overman. I thought this was a, I thought this was a bad idea. I thought I felt like the Superman was some sort of accidental prelude to transhumanism. Right. And it was only in this reading we've been doing of Thus Spake Zarathustra where I actually got a physical paper copy of it and I was reading through and it was the juxtaposition with the other archetype that he presents sort of paired with the Superman that things began to come into focus because he's not just talking about the Superman. He's also talking about the last man, the, the yeah. thing that a lot of us know from, well, people in poli sci anyways, might know from Fukuyama. Yeah. Um, but uh, this, of course, comes from Nietzsche. But, you know, the Superman and the last man are kind of juxtaposed with each other. But this translation, mm -hmm. which is the um, Hollingdale translation, doesn't translate uh, Letzemensch as the last man. Yeah. He translates it as the ultimate man. And when you think about it, it's like last and ultimate are like technically semantic equivalents, but the connotation is very different. You know, the last man implies it's like a final point on a trajectory. And it's like, um, it's like, this is where this is leading to. Whereas the ultimate implies it's, it's a, like a pure distillation of a concept um, or, or a pure expression of an ideal. And the, the pure expression of the ideal of man Im okay. sort of implies what Nietzsche means when he's talking about man in terms of the thing that's to be overcome. And when I did not know it, where you were going with that. When you brought it up the first time, I was like, oh, yeah, either synonyms, whatever. And, and yeah. I totally see it now. Yeah, that yeah. makes perfect. I like where you're going with that. And, can, and you so, keep, can you keep going that way? Because my dogs drive me crazy. I'm yeah, like, <laughs> no, sure. Yeah. And, and it, it just it suddenly clarified that what is meant by man is not actually biological at all. It's ex actually exactly the opposite because he, he, he describes these last men as despisers of the body, which is like that. That's what transhumanism uh, uh, expresses is this distaste for, um, you know, the, the grossness, the unpredictability of the physical nature of our species. So um, in juxtaposition with the let's image, not just the, the, the ultimate man translation, but the, um, the descriptions he gives of these men throws what is meant by man into a completely different light, more of a, more of a spiritual light than a biological light. And so, um, I, I thought that was uh, it completely changed my understanding of what he meant by Superman completely. And, and it, it felt more like an overcoming of certain hindering ideals than it was a pursuit to overcome our physical limitations or whatever the transhumanists are trying to um, overcome. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, that's kind of where I was at with it anyway, but like your, your point about the last man um, makes more sense, uh, you know, in terms of uh, being the, it, it's the ultimate expression of this thing that he doesn't like. Uh, yes. you know, like it, 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 this, uh, this, this man who just, who just like, who, uh, you know, thinks he has the world figured out and also is also, you know, like 
has all so boring. Yeah, he he hates NPCs. And and it's NPCs dead, basically. (laughs) But it's it's the exact antithesis of what you opened with this. This the the lick of the lightning. It's that it's that flame of energy and motion and a degree of unpredictability, perhaps. And the the what the last man, the ultimate man, sort of embodies is this caricature of a constrained and systematized existence he he cares about himself he cares about getting good sleep um yes. as we see later in the uh in the story and um like he is this systematized one might say uh to borrow from training culture this optimized uh man um yes. but in, in a in a boring way he lacked the the spark of of uh, like creative genius in him. Yeah, I mean that's that's how he describes him. Is he, he, he can't he can no longer create. Uh, basically, mm. he can only create, he can only follow, and you know like do what's necessary. And you can see it. I mean, obviously, that's the critique of you know all the people who we would call NPCs, the people who just kind of go through life. And nod and like do their thing. They, they go through by code and algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they check the boxes. Uh, you know, they check the boxes. And uh, you know, to that point, uh, we're seeing a lot of them. You know, a lot of their jobs are really can be done by AI pretty quickly <laughs> uh, because they're just all they do is like apply the formula, <laughs> and uh, that's yeah. uh, machines can apply the formula. They don't need you to like uh, or like things that you know. Uh, some of us who you know have to send emails and things like that. I don't do a lot of this, but I know our trainers in the group, uh, the coaches and stuff, have to do a lot of like uh, Zapier or Zapier like uh, automations, where you send an email and then it sends this email back to you, and then this email back to you, and the other things that are like all like organized so that all happens without you. Uh, that yeah. you know, just this is what you need to get. This is the experience you're about to have. Uh, so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that going on, and you, obviously the this last man, you know that it's a great. I mean, I like it as last man because then I took it and made first man for our thing, uh, yeah. you know, for the the order of fire, and I'm going to stick to that. But as far as the uh, idea of it being like the ultimate expression of this thing that he hates and that he wants to man to move beyond, then it, it does make a lot more sense. Right. Oh, and, and last man is still the slightly more correct and literal translation of let's image. It's just, right. um, it also implies this ultimate man. It, it, it yeah. has both connotations and, and the other, the, the other connotation was helpful to me in understanding what he meant, but right. you don't even need the language. If you just read the description, actually, should I read the description of the, the last man for the audience? Just so people who haven't read Nietzsche, please do it. It's fantastic. Should. Everybody, right. everybody's, everybody knows. It, like, they, once you listen to the last man, you're like, "Oh, I know that guy." Yeah, and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Nietzsche doesn't write like a last man, which most academics write like, which is also uh, very, very uh, refreshing. Yeah. So he says, "Behold, I show you the ultimate man, or the last man." Quote: What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? Thus asks the last man and blinks. The earth has become small, and upon it hops. This, the last man who makes everything small. His race is an is as inexterminable as the flea. The ultimate man lives longest. We have discovered happiness, say, say the ultimate men, and blink. They have left the places where living was hard, for one needs warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs oneself against him, for one needs warmth. Sickness and mistrust count as sins with them. One should go about warily. He is a fool who still stumbles over stones or over men. A little poison now and then that produces pleasant dreams and a lot of poison at last for a pleasant death. They still work for work is entertainment, but they take care the entertainment does not exhaust them. Nobody grows rich or poor anymore. Both are too much of a burden. Who still wants to rule? Who obey? Both are too much of a burden. No herdsman and one herd. Everyone wants the same thing. Everyone is the same. Whoever thinks otherwise goes voluntarily into the madhouse. 
Formerly all the world was mad, say the most acute of them, and blink. They are clever and know everything that has ever happened, so there is no end to their mockery. They still quarrel, but they soon make up, otherwise indigestion would result. They have their little pleasure for the day and their little pleasure for the night, but they respect health. We have discovered happiness, say the ultimate men, and blink. And that's our description of the last men or the ultimate man. And it's this, um, I, I think of Reddit culture, uh, but there's probably a few different things that come to mind. 2020. Yeah. <laughs> like that's all I hear when I hear that. Like, like uh, no. <laughs> you got trust the science in there. You got, and then you have like the arc that goes to euthanasia. We have a little, a little bit of poison. Yeah, like yeah, like he's he's uh, that's that that's that's what's most prophetic. This that part that you just read is one of the most prophetic yeah. parts about this book. Because it, one just, heard. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's just uh, when I I think of guys like uh, who's who's the guy we always make fun of the uh, who used to be smart uh, the atheist. Oh, um, uh, crazy now. Uh, there's a few of them. <laughs> uh, Richard Dawkins comes to mind. No, Sam the Harris. ones that everybody makes fun of. Oh, Sam Harris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 the uh, yeah, I and mean, there's a, a, a kind of a jab at Sam Harris in there in terms of like they they, they figured everything out. Yeah, we've discovered and, morality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, hitherto, no one knew what morality was, but we know what morality is. We have science to tell us what morality is. That was in 2014. That was before he went mad. But yeah. uh, anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, that's in there, uh, you know, all these things that have, are around us constantly now. Uh, uh, but uh, in the, yeah, the idea that they have, I'm looking, looking at the chapter now, I actually went ahead of it. Um, okay, there's so many points. Obviously, the uh, fixation with long life is in there. Yeah. Which is not necessarily bad, but uh, you know, it is, it is what it is, yeah. Well, and it, and Nietzsche is funny when it comes to health because, on the one hand, he is, um, he is particularly concerned with health, absolutely, Nietzsche himself is. Um, but there's, there's a different, it's a it has a different purpose, like, like Nietzsche is concerned with health as a means to an end. But it's people, vitality, right? Yeah, is what well, he's with. And, and health as a um, health as a how, how do I put it? Like philosophy and spirit that is that that follows from good health is um, is positive and is a good thing and is is pro life in a, in a very broad sense, not in the narrow political sense, but like there's actually something very sickly in the obsession with health that one sees in the last man. And you see this in, I, I hadn't heard this term until our, our friend Josh mentioned it to us, the, this term orthorexia, yeah. sort of obsession with eating the right things. And there's this beautiful line, not in Thus Spake Zarathustra, but in, I believe it's the birth of tragedy mm -hmm. where Nietzsche describes these, I'm sure I've mentioned this quote before because I love it. Um, the the condescension and the contempt of the elites for the the uncouth dirtiness of the of the Mardi Gras of the of the Dionysian hubbub and yes. the, the the roar of the parade and they look down and like oh the dirty rabble and their stuff and he says they have no idea how pale and sickly that contempt looks to the next to the juxtaposed with the roaring health of the Dionysian as it goes by. It's it's a, a notion of health measured in terms of what it can withstand, in terms of not just resilience, but anti-fragility. He basically invented the idea of anti-fragility before Nassim Taleb came about. Yeah. And uh, as we mentioned in the quote section earlier, um, whereas the, and, and so his view of health is very much in relation to being resilient and anti-fragile whereas the the i the notion of health c conceived by the last man is in 
risk management. It's in safety. It's in it's big pharma. It's yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's in, like here's all the thing. Here's like cures because I'm sure he had that in his age. People obsessed with cures, mm, like a snake oil was, salesman. Yeah, yes. yeah. There were a lot of that in that in those periods, and then there were a lot of uh, that's kind of the dawn of the quack health like industry. It is that age because uh, that's when you get into like a little bit after that. I think is when you get into like Kellogg. And all these people that are all, people are always going to like res, retreats and whatever. But it's it's basically like the you know the bourgeois like class like they don't they have enough time on their hands to to obsess about things. And that also gives birth to psychology. Uh, but you know like they have times to like navel gaze and also like I feel a little strange today. I wonder if I should. But but it's really they have very. They probably had the first sedentary lifestyles. You know, compared yeah. to, well, I mean, I wouldn't say the first, but they obviously there were kings and whatever uh, before that. But well, there were a large class. group of people that had like a fairly sedentary lifestyle, just sat in the office and went and then enjoyed rich food. And then so they had all these issues that we we see now. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, because they weren't the rabble uh, out there, the Dionysian hordes, because those those people had to go to work. <laughs> like, like they're having fun because they had to go. They had to go scomp those ga goddamn grapes. Uh, so they, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, but a few more of the things that it, it pointed out there because there's just so many. Um, and then we'll get back to the Ubermensch. But it, it, the the last band kind of defines the Ubermensch as you said because it's the opposite. It's it, it it's always easier to define the thing that you don't like than it is to define the thing <laughs> you do like. And I think that that's clear in this as well because the Ubermensch is very vague and the last man is very fucking clear about who this guy is uh but uh a few of the things that it it calls out that have, they're just amazing um as you said there is no end to their mockery again that was more 2020 stuff like 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 oh these fools they don't do the thing that we were always supposed to do and like uh you know like just constantly it's not the constant mockery that came with that but also that's true of the entrenched, entrenched, you know, clash of the regime, as, as they call it, to a certain extent. It's like the the Saturday Night Live kind of big com comedy culture. Like, oh well, we make fun of all these dirty, unwashed people who don't believe the correct things. Well, uh, it, it but, also seems to come alongside the belief that you know everything. Yeah, too, which, which he mentions, and it's like all these people who have access to Wikipedia believe that they have access to all knowledge right. as if all knowledge was on wikipedia which is right. hilarious to anyone who has ever tracked a single wikipedia page over any length of time like <laughs> you, not that you would know anything about that but no, um, no, no, no. <laughs> uh like the, the the illusion of complete knowledge leads yeah. to a kind of condescension that like oh these people think they uh, know something when we clearly know it's the opposite and that that authoritative attitude which i think 2020 was largely a symptom of in domains yeah. other than wikipedia um is a, a big impetus for this it's it's one of the amusingly tragic bits about science i think in the 21st century is that mm -hmm. um science sort of begins with the presumption that you don't know anything, that yeah. even established wisdom and knowledge is faulty. And I mean, it might be true, but let's go test it just to make sure. Let's let's try to reproduce these findings. And like half of the great findings in science over the last hundred years began with people trying to reproduce something and failing. And they're like, huh, why did this not reproduce here? And then it leads to further exploration and some new breakthrough comes through and it's cool, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, the, the 21st century attitude towards science seems to be the opposite in a very unscientific way. It's like, we have science, therefore we know things. It's like, yeah. The, 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 it's, it's not just a non sequitur. It's, it's almost an oxymoron, you know, in, in yeah. its attitude and it, that, that, that IFL science Reddit attitude of, we know things seems to be deeply associated not just with the the poverty of the soul of the last man and the lack of creativity but also the desire to mock everybody who defies what you think you know 
Yeah, well, and that's a lot based on credentialism. And the it, like, if you've invested in the system, you have to believe the system is true. And I actually had a little uh, back and forth, not a back and forth, really, but uh, just shared some comments with uh, Ajax today, uh, because there's this uh, fitness community. It's part of the fitness community that's called the like evidence based fitness community. And um, <laughs> and they were the people that I'm like, I, I remember I remember them during the time because I followed everybody. And then I remember when everything was going down in 2020, they were the ones that were like deep into it. We're still defending the system and, and actually promoting the things that are unhealthy and bad. Uh, you know, but we, which we all knew because it was obvious, but they were like, no, no, we, we are experts. We have PhDs and you do not. Therefore, and they're just asking their PhD, other PhD friend and they're like, oh, no, well, this is the consensus of what we're doing. Yeah. And so that which it, is like uh, it's fine to go with consensus, just like consensus is not the same as evidence and evidence right. is also not the same as certainty. And it's yeah. the conflation of. We think we have good reason to believe this, which you could make a case for. Sure. Um, with uh, we're certain and you're wrong. Oh yeah, like, they, like they, that, they that, straight that. up mocked people all the. Yeah. They, they were they were, and that's why like when they get brought up, I like shut it down really quick because I'm like, nope, we're not. I'm not. Gonna, <laughs> I, I, I never forgive and I never forget, and they they I will never promote their shit. Uh, and it was funny because I, I didn't realize Azak was on that page too, but he's like he's like, oh no, I remember. <laughs> and I, I wrote them off. he's like, I wrote them off that day. Like, uh, like, like uh, as that happened, he's like, I wrote them off too. So I was glad to hear that too, because he's, I'm a fan of his. Um, but uh, yeah, formerly the entire world was mad is another part of that. That is yes. like, and that I think has to do with, uh, you know, the death of God a little bit uh, in the sense that like, it's interesting because there he hates the like whole Christian man, but they were actually kind of moving past that in his age, which he was talking about. Yeah, and well, yeah, the scientism and like, and there is a sense that like, you know, as you did the new atheist thing for a while, like everyone was ridiculous before the age of reason. before Francis Bacon, really. Yeah, yeah, and everybody was retarded, and they they believed the craziest things. And yeah. and that's that is still the attitude of many of these people, and I I know some people who who still think like that. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I, yeah. I enjoy I enjoy mocking Christianity in in, in parts uh, as much as the next person, for but sure. for all of the problems Christianity has, a lot of the Christian theologians and philosophers of the medieval ages were actually very good about respecting the the thinkers that came before them like Aquinas uh, was famously um, is believed to be by many a better Aristotelian than Aristotle. Right. Um, and, and, you know, Augustine was very much a Platonist and there was, there was respect for the thought that came before. Whereas, you know, here I am in, when was this 2006 or 2007 taking some like high school science course and my first introduction to Aristotle mm -hmm. is like Aristotle invented science, but he he was really not a very good empiricist um, because he was a sexist and because he thought teeth had uh, horses had the wrong number of teeth. So he was kind of he was kind of wrong about most things, but you know he had he had some good ideas about empiricism. Uh, the, the the condescension of the present age towards arguably the most brilliant human being who ever lived uh and, and just hand waving that away for ninth graders was yeah. uh was an extraordinary experience i didn't realize how extraordinary that was at the time because i didn't know anything about aristotle as a ninth grader other than he got the number of teeth on a horse wrong because he didn't check or something um never mind all the, the absolutely brilliant uh thought he had elsewhere that most of the people who composed this you know uh, curricula probably couldn't understand at all. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that, that kind of dismissiveness of the post-Christian age almost feels more last man than the Christian one. Um, at least, at least in Christianity, you had this aspirational ideal of Zoe life, this, this creative spark of divine energy that you see a glimpse of in 
the the ideal of the Superman. And it almost felt like Nietzsche's depiction of the death of God, which we haven't quite talked about, I don't I don't think yet, but um led to some kind of fork in the road. And we could go down the path of the last man or we could go down the path of the Superman. And uh, maybe that's what he's outlining. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I, I, it's definitely Nietzsche's, you know, kind of eternally mad about Christianity because uh, he, he was raised to be a pastor and went to school for it originally. Mm. Um, but, and then, you know, transferred into other things. Uh, but uh, you know, he's definitely of that world and understands it very, very well. And I bet he could tell some funny Bible jokes uh because <laughs> people yeah. who are brought up that way i've known some people who like were brought up in super religious households and they know the bible backwards and forwards and they can pick out the funny parts but <laughs> cuz they're not looking at them from an outside skeptic point they were in it and uh, they've sat and listened to that story and they, and thought to themselves you know that guy was a dork, you know like, <laughs> like they, they've had that thought about the bible that i i, I couldn't be bothered to even read that deep to like find to have that like you know these people when they talk to these people that was ridiculous you know uh but there there are guys who, are, who have been raised that that deep in it who are just hilarious because they've they have it referenced so and i think that nietzsche was one of those guys so oh, i think yeah. he really grokked uh you know uh christianity uh and and I, that's why we say i don't have any christian any uh critiques of christianity that nietzsche didn't already say uh better you know, like I, I don't really need to get into it uh, because I, I just feel like what what he said is pretty much where I'm at uh, with it as far as the the way it uh, this kind of enshrinement of which of, which you know. we can summarize as uh, he thought Jesus was okay as a kind of Semitic Buddhist, uh, but Paul went took everything in the wrong direction by means of resentment, resentment. Um, that's the, the essence of his critique. Yeah, yeah. That Jesus, and, Jesus, okay. Paul, really bad. Yeah, yeah. He, he's definitely a. Um, he has a lot. Of, he has a lot of feels about Christianity for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the the whole book, the Antichrist, is good. <laughs> well, uh, that. my I I can't prove this or demonstrate this, but my mm -hmm. my feeling with Nietzsche is that his for his. Um, Hatred of Christianity comes from the feeling that it killed his father, because mm. his father was, as you said, a, a, a pastor. Yeah, um, he was beginning to go to school for for seminary. Ended up, well, initially for music, then for seminary, then for philology and other stuff. But um, I mean, as he began to see the connection between philosophy and health, and the way that Christianity and the embrace of values that equalize down away from the embrace of what is best and healthy could have a long-term detrimental effect on the health, the biological health of a society. I think it would be easy to, to look at his father's ill health and perhaps his own ill health and to say, did Christianity do this over 1500 years hmm. by blessing the poor and the meek and the sick and cursing the wealthy and the healthy and the best right in a in a in a long-term selective almost darwinian kind of process and um th that that's my that's my feeling on what his thinking was and i'm not saying that's necessarily good or bad but it's the it's the 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 theme that seems to kind of come through all of his work in light of his association of philosophy with um, health mm -hmm. and sickness, which is a very persistent theme, especially in his later writings. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it, whether or not that was, you know, uh, conscious or, or unconscious, it could be either way, uh, right. you know, in terms of, uh, the sense of being surrounded. I, I can't imagine what, obviously we live in a world where we have a fairly secular society and are not, um, I don't think either one of us are from extremely religious. Are we? Are you from a really religious? Okay. No. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I am very religious, but I wasn't raised that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I no. I uh, 
I mean, I was raised Catholic, but it was, you know, it was kind of like my parents were just trying to do what you're supposed to do. You know, like they, they, my mom was Catholic. My dad was Protestant. She, he had to convert because uh, that was the thing that you had to do at that point. And uh, he had to go to class. I remember my, I, I have a very specific memory of my dad going to class, like uh, to, to go to learn to be a Catholic because uh, you have to do that. And then, uh, and then, you know, I was raised Catholic and then, but I was just a jerk. I hated Christianity first. People always think that, <laughs> people always think that I hated it for different reasons later, but uh, I just hated Christianity. Like, for, like, I, yeah, I got kicked out of uh, Sunday school when I was like 12. Uh, and then, <laughs> like, I just, you know, like I was okay up until a certain age. I got, I did the first communion thing. And then, uh, you know, I, I was, but I was never confirmed. I never made it the whole way. Cause I, I, I was just a jerk. I was just like, this is dumb and it's boring and it's stupid. And I, I remember I, I did terrible things. I was a good student in school. I was like a good kid, but you took me into like, I had to go to catechism class. I'm like, I think we had to go to week on the weeknight too. And uh, I didn't go to I remember like I'd put my feet up on the desk in front of me and be just a brat, you know, like <laughs> until, until like they finally were just like, you need to leave. You know, like, <laughs> like I managed to get kicked out of, of uh, Sunday's going out. You know, I was like a kid, you know, like, but I was just like, nope, this is stupid. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that was that, that was my my impression of it from a very, very young age. So that's kind of always how I've been. It's funny. I was almost exactly the opposite. I was um, I, I was, you know, we, we were a go to su- church on Sunday when we remember to, which is probably two out of three Sundays uh, with some spats of forgetting. Uh, we were very much a Sunday Christian family. Yeah. But as I passed from middle school into high school, I began to like, wait a second, this is about our relationship with the creator of the universe. This should be like the most important thing ever. And I it was like, I was reading the Bible on my own for personal edification. And my parents were like, he's reading the Bible. Like, <laughs> and, and, and I, I had like a little rock that I would keep in my pocket that had Philippians four, eight on it, which was my favorite verse. Yeah. Uh, still is in many ways. Um, as is, by the way, uh, it was of Christopher Hitchens who was baptized into the, uh, Greek Orthodox church. Uh, not because he was a believer, but as you said, you got to do what you got to do. And his first wife was Greek. So, right. Um, but it was, in high school, I only began to turn against Christianity when I when I saw some arguments against it that felt very compelling about the efficacy of prayer and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I realized I was trying really hard to believe. And it was only my effort that was keeping me there. And once I like saw that, I sort of let go. And then I was I became very angry, not at God, but at this nominally Christian community around me that had literally never cared enough about the most important questions in the world to even take it seriously and entertain these things. But it wasn't anger at God. It was like, that, 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 that's silly. That doesn't make any sense. It was like, no, all of these unserious people going through the motions about serious things. But um, yeah, but it was a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's very much the last man thing, you know, like, well, it's, it's what the madman yeah. describes in the marketplace when he says, you know, yeah. God is dead, but all these people don't realize it yet. It's like yeah. it takes time. And these people who are going through the motions of Christian faith, yeah. there, there was a couple of sociologists who put out a paper called uh, Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. And they said that actually the largest religion in the United States is not Christianity. It's this other thing called moralistic therapeutic deism or mtd for short Uh and moralistic therapeutic deism holds that there is a god who wants people to be nice he doesn't usually interfere in things but he sometimes grants you what you pray for and good people go to heaven when they die there's nothing about hell it's this vague feel-good kind of last man rendition of Christianity, a sort of last gasp of dying Christianity that has almost no theological crossover with authentic Christianity, but can be seen as a sort of symptom of the cultural death of Christianity and the body of the nation. 
Oh yeah, most people like they, it's just a it's like a quote or a verse or something. They they have very the very light way to tell. As I as I've often said, although I've never seen a pornographic film myself, uh, there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of uh, uh, crosses on people and tattoos and porn. Like <laughs> like a lot lot of cross tattoos and porn. Uh, like it's it's just a thing that people get that they think they're supposed to get, and. It, it makes the most sense and it's comforting in certain because you know, like you said, it's all good things. Or or better yet, on on ex porn stars. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. a little different, but yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, but uh yeah, they, they well they ex Christians or whatever <laughs> they, they they go. I mean, so many people get their cross tattoo or whatever, it's one of their first tattoos they get. Uh these ugly ones they get now, they have the three crosses and they're kind of like look like a sketch. There's a lot of dudes. Who oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it, it's 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 a virtue signal uh, for sure. And it's just basically like I'm a good person uh, and and therefore and that's comforting enough. And then you don't really have to do anything beyond that. You know, just say, like I'm a good person. I believe in God. God's nice. God's the God of niceness. And uh, he's we don't have to go into too far of like which football team he likes or whatever. Uh, but, uh, it is a thing, you know, like uh, God's nice and he's going to be nice to you if you're, if you're, if you're a nice person. Uh, and that's kind of, like you said, that's, that's the main, I think, religion of America. Uh, yeah, I think you're accurate with that. They go, they go through the religious system, but that's where the most of them are. Uh, you know, because they, otherwise mainstream society kind of almost even, wouldn't even work. Um, right. There was this great Matthew, Cro I'm going to spend 10 seconds trying to find it. Right. But there's this great Matthew Crawford quote about that kind of Christian moral signaling. Right. And I, I hope this doesn't come across as just bashing on Christianity for the sake of bashing on Christianity in right. the context of a conversation about the Ubermensch and the cultural context of the creation of the Ubermensch and the Letzemensch. But there's this um, there's this quote from Matthew Crawford's book, uh, which is called uh, Why We Drive which came out just a couple of years ago where he describes, if I can't find it, I'll just have to, to remember the, the, the summary of it. And I'm not finding it quickly. So uh, basically he was, he was meeting this, uh, this former, uh, it was a Christian who, who spoke with the, uh, the, the, the salesman persona that he had come to associate with ex cons or oh, something yeah. like that. And it's this, it's this thing of, and that's why I mentioned like ex porn stars. There's actually a, a fairly popular Christian pastor who is on TikTok and on Instagram, who is a former porn star. And he has uh, re repented of this oh, yeah. and is, is talking about the, the evil of the industry now. And so Christianity becomes this kind of, cover it becomes a kind of spiritual comfort uh so that you don't have to deal with or address that and, and nietzsche wrote when he was talking about that in the, in the context of the last man a little poison for a little comfort and at the end a great deal of poison he he and not to sound too marxist because i think marx stole this from nietzsche to a degree i don't know if that chronology works actually but he, there's this idea that the the forgiveness that is offered by Christianity can be a way to avoid the pain of having done something wrong. And so there's this constant temptation for people who it's not so much always the case that Christianity induces guilt, but Christianity can take that guilt and um, freeze it, make it permanent, but also prevent it from spreading any further. And say, oh, I don't have to. It's like Mason Verger. Uh, I don't have to feel guilty anymore. I, <laughs> we, are, yeah. are we not going to just quote uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, like Hannibal Buress in every right. episode now? <laughs> and like, well, because I, 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 I have, I have, I have uh, immunity from the risen Jesus. And nobody right, the riz. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what 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 is it about these guys that they know that much about the whole Hannibal Lecter series? <laughs> Uh, but uh, what are we missing here? Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's 
and, and obviously I was raised Catholic, so that's we had a head start on that uh, in terms of because in, in, when you're Catholic, you just uh, go and confess your sins to the priest, and then the priest gives you prayers to say, and you go say ten Hail Marys, and you're good. Uh, as long as you were really sorry that you really did, if you're really sorry that you did it, uh, then uh, you know. And so I, I remember as a little kid, that was my my big thing. Is I was, everyone would, you were supposed to feel guilty, and so you would go and um, sit in these boxes where the priest can see. You see them in the movies, right? Uh, where the priest can can kind of see you, but kind of can't, and that way you can tell your terrible sins. You know, like whatever I ate too much candy. You're a kid. You don't have sins. And uh, and so like you're telling him what, what you did bad, I told a lie or something. And uh, I was having none of that as a kid. I because I, you could also just talk to him. And so I'd pull the chair around and be like, okay, so I, I don't really think this is bad. You're like, I'm like, <laughs> I, I, like uh, so uh, you know, I, I was that kid. <laughs> so, uh, but but to to, to say it back because we obviously know what we don't like about Christianity and what what is the um, what Nietzsche didn't like about it. Um, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it feels like Christianity is almost a, if, if the last man, as he describes as the ultimate man, it feels like the Christian man is almost the penultimate man. It's like, yeah. it's not the last man, but it is some kind of, if, if his goal, if his idea is current man is the bridge to the Superman, then yeah. the Christian man is sort of the bridge to the last man. And it's like if we could go back to that fork and maybe go the other way, we might be might be better off. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, because and that's as we were saying about you know, kind of woke, and it's not like the only thing, and there'll be a replacement of woke or whatever. It's just another religion. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, the the idea of woke took over the Christianity, all the features of Christianity, without some of the better ones. Right. right, like without some of the more redeeming features, because it's not like I mean something doesn't exist for a thousand years without having like a redeeming feature, without having some freaking winged hussars and so forth. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they, I mean, they they did some nice things. I mean, a lot of fantastic symphonies. Uh, you know, like, there were there were some yeah. good th things there. So, uh, whereas you know, it, there's less of that uh, with the new thing because it's be this thing without. For I think that Nietzsche would probably agree that. Uh, Christianity had passion to it. I mean, we get we we use passion from you know Christian things a lot, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, Christianity had this kind of struggle and and uh, like uh, it's, it, it's it's a tormented thing, so it's very emotional. Yeah, and, and so there's that's, a, there's it, a, it's a made, tragic story arc. There. It made yeah. great tragic art because if you look at Christianity, the Christian art is beautiful, but it's beautiful in a very tragic way. Usually, it's like it, it's you know it's a lot of. It's a lot of death and uh, and uh, suffering, um, but but to bring it back to the Overman, so we get have a better sense of what the Overman is, and uh, yeah. not just the last man, since you know I try to do what we advertise we're going to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm going to read the part that just before what you read, which is the part where he really talks about the Overman. Mm. And uh, in mine, it's the Overhuman. In this particular translation. I have several sitting around, but this is the one that's on my uh, iPad. Uh, so when he spoke, it, it, when he goes down the market square and talks to the people, he says, I teach you the overman, the overhuman. The human is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome it? All beings so far have created something beyond themselves. And you want to be the ebb of this great tide and go even go back to the beast rather than overcome the human. What is the ape for the human being? A laughingstock or a painful cause of shame. And the human shall be just that for the overhuman. A laughingstock or a painful cause for shame. Once you have made your way from worm to human, and much as you is still worm, once you were apes, and even now, the human being is still more of an ape than any ape is. Whoever is the wisest among you is still no more than a discord and a hybrid between plant and specter. But I do bid you become specters, or but do I bid you become specters or plants? Behold, I teach you the overhuman. The overhuman is the sense of the earth. 
May your will say, let the overhuman be the sense of the earth. And that is, I, I'm going to jump, I'm going to continue, but I just want to say right there that that reminds me a lot of kind of how you ended the essay um, that you've been working on that is in our new uh, Pater book. The, the, the overhuman is the sense of the earth, like the sense of like a, a body, like a healthy body. It's it's the sense of like embracing that. Uh, yes. It's kind of related to a lot of the things that you said towards the end of that uh, that essay. And and to tie it back to our conversation about guilt, um, mm -hmm. this line of poetry comes to mind. Um, a very famous, I forget the the author. Someone in the comments will no doubt have it offhand. But mm -hmm. this poet said, uh, "I've never seen a wild thing feel sorry for itself." Yes. A bird will, you know, freeze to death in the cold, drop dead from the cold without ever feeling sorry for itself. And in that sense, I think not only self-pity, but also guilt is a kind of feeling sorry for itself and an alienation from the the wild thingness of the overman that he is um that he's advocating. Right. And the, the contrast, I think, to Nietzsche is, is another philosopher of about the same time who is in many ways actually very comparable to Nietzsche, but who went all in on Christianity. And that was Kierkegaard. Okay. And Kierkegaard famously talked about the, the night of faith is, uh, you know, faced with an impossible choice, uh, a moral choice between... Um, being a, a a martyr and doing uh what must be done at the cost of what he wants to do or becoming the villain and doing what he wants to do at the expense of what should be done you know the villain rejects duty and does what he wants and the um the the martyr does his duty at the expense of what he would like to do but he says the knight of faith is a strange character who rejects both duty and personal desire with not just the hope, but with the absolute certainty that both things will be accomplished of their own. And that is the knight of faith. That That's Kierkegaard's ideal the, and the, the leap of faith that he advances in um, Fear and Trembling. But with, the, with the example of Abraham, which is a very, very thoughtful exploration of the story of abraham mm -hmm. and isaac and what would cause one to be willing to kill your son never mind that you didn't do it the fact that you were willing to do it at all um and it, it what it feels like nietzsche is doing is going the other way and saying you know whence cometh this religious notion of moralistic duty that's creating all of this guilt and creating this seeming madness of faith and i don't even think kierkegaard would disagree with the label of madness mm -hmm. um or at least irrationality but uh if we, if nietzsche's will to power means anything in this context it's the, the his amoralism is the embrace of we'll we'll do what other people call being a villain but being a villain is the embrace of the spirit of life Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot in there to back to. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep reading this so we stay on the Uber. Sure. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean. So to we don't get too far off the, <laughs> off, off the thing. Uh, no, I mean that's all. That's all the high value stuff. But uh, um, I beseech you, my brothers, stay true to the earth and do not believe those who walk, who talk of over earthly hopes. This is a weird <laughs> translation. I'm like, why is it saying over earthly? Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm stumbling on. Uh, they are poison Isn't that, mixes. Wasn't that usually translated as um, supernatural? Yeah, supernatural, or yeah, like uh, yeah, like uh, all the other words we would actually use for yeah. afterlife. We find uh, some weird translations. Other, <laughs> other, word, in that one. <laughs> other worldly would have made yeah, other worldly yeah. would have made more sense uh, in English. It's a strange one. Uh, but uh, they are poison mixers, whether they know it or not. They are despisers of life, moribund, and poisoned themselves of whom the earth is weary, so let them pass on. Once sacrilege against God was the greatest sacrilege, but God died, and therefore the sacrilege died too. 
Sacrilege against the earth is now the most terrible thing, and to reverse, to revere the entrails of the unfathomable more than the sense of the earth. Once the soul looked despisingly upon the body, and at that time this despising was the highest thing. She wanted to be lean, ghastly, and starved. Thus she thought to slip away from the body in the earth. And that's, again, he's overplaying the fucking, the, the feminine in the German of yeah. the soul, uh, which is making it weird. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize this was a, that weird of a translation. Uh, but uh, but what you're describing there in that, in that passage is what we talked about a few episodes ago with Gnosticism, the, the desire to escape the body and well, yeah. this earth. And that's what he's saying about all otherworldly things is that and that's and, and it extends into uh ai well into uh transhumanism or posthumanism right and that's another way to escape the body and escape the earth and that's you know something i've been writing about uh recently for for the the new book as well it's like all all these people are trying to escape their body and they're escaping being human yes and that's when he's saying stay true to the earth he said, "Like embracing the fact, embrace what you are. You're, you're like you're a human. You're an animal. You're this thing that's attached to the earth." And I think it's a very smart thing to say, and very much something in line with our philosophy that we've been talking about. You know, like embrace what you are and the joys and the limitations of life. Um, you can extend those limitations to a certain extent. Uh, you know, using a tool, any t literally any tool, picking up a rock is an extension of the human body, like it's something that humans do that almost no animals do. A couple, a few of them do, but um, it's making extension your body. That is, that is the start of cyborgism. Like when, when you use a tool, well, but that's part of what we do, you know? Right. So that's, it's, it's you basically embrace that, but it, it has limits. And there's a difference in, there's a difference in desire because you hear this from certain transhumanists, like, like you've all know Harari types where they like to say, well, transhumanism is not fundamentally different than the use of technology that we've always done. Language is a technology. Um, you know, uh, the yeah. wheel is technology. All of these things are technologies. So really, there's no difference between what we're trying to do, which is motivated by a hatred and disgust toward the human body. Right. And all the technologies of the past that we're equivocating with which we're trying to solve particular problems to make life for the human body like a little bit better and enhance it. It's like right. the, the, the motivation is different and how it plays out can sometimes be very subtle, but the spirit behind it is what, what, uh, to bring Crawford up again. It's like, there's different philosophies of design that distinguish kinds of technology. That's right. why there's a different feeling in getting in a, 1985 Toyota pickup versus a modern 80% automated 2023 Mercedes Benz, like right. where there's essentially a hood underneath the hood and it's not designed for you to mess with. It pipes engine sounds in through the sound system. So it's, 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 you're not actually even hearing the real engine because it's too quiet. It's, it's a simulated simulacra of the experience of driving but it's, it's an automatic, not a manual. Um, I, I can't wait for the cars to come out that will have uh, uh, manual shifters that are like crosswalk push buttons. They don't do anything, but you can flip it around and feel like you're driving an automatic, even though, or a manual, even yeah. though you're not. We're not that far away from that. No, I wouldn't but, be surprised. Um, but like, it's the difference between aspiring to be a driver and aspiring to be a passenger. And the the last man or the ultimate man aspires to be a passenger because being a driver is too burdensome. Who wants to lead? Who wants to follow? Who wants to give commands or take on the responsibility of following a command? Well, you know, both of those are responsibilities. Um, whereas the, the ideal of the overman or the superman is, is to be that driver and not a passenger. Yeah. Now I'm going to skip a couple lines down to what I what really jumped out at me this time in reading it is that 
that, that passage that I started with at the at the beginning of the intro, uh, and he's like, uh, "What is the greatest thing that you could experience?" And in the in the Thomas Common uh, thing that I used because it's public domain in the intro, uh, it said, uh, "This is your, your great despising." The hour of great despising. In the, in the Thomas comment, it was the hour of contempt, which just sounds a lot better. Uh, but uh, the hour of contempt, and what it's what's it contempt for? Uh, the hour in which even your happiness disgusts, disgusts you, and likewise your reason and virtue. And see, this is difficult. <laughs> you know, that's that's a little bit of a that's that's a little wormy. Uh, you know, like what what are you talking about? You know. Um, and this is where I may not agree. I may not agree, <laughs> you know, well, but I mean, it's, it's, so he says the hour when you say, what good is my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment, but my habit, but my happiness should justify existence itself. And so like, I, like you don't have to measure your happiness against it, it's the desire to like measure it against something versus like my happiness. He, he wants you to have happiness like an animal would. And it kind of brought me back to the child metaphor of like, oh, mm -hmm. you, like it come to it, like, what would a child think of that? Like, or, like, yeah. it was, I don't know if that's really how humans work, uh, you know, but to just let go of that. But uh, this, it, it's interesting. You know what this feels like? Hmm. It feels like he is cryptically criticizing utilitarianism. And when he talks about a, a contempt, for your own happiness he's not talking about a contempt of this is just i'm spitballing here i don't know but it doesn't sound like he's talking about a contempt for fulfillment or satisfaction or joy but a or joy certainly i mean joy in the lightning is seems to be the goal yeah the joyful wisdom is a whole book but um it seems to be a contempt for like utility yes. and hedons and this sort of quantitative approach to happiness that was very popular in his time among the English psychologists, which is code for John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, um, the the utilitarians of his day. Well, I was just reading the comments, and I, Mick Tewis had given us a beer of cheers, but then he redacted it, so I don't know what that's about. Oh, well. <laughs> 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 I, I'm sure it has nothing to do with it, but I, I just remember I noticed I'm like, huh, I remember what it's, was there. There's a beer uh, symbol in a in a in a conversation about Nisha. I should pull that back. I'm actually uh, just finished a little bit of Kahlua, so I'm being an anti Nietzschean Nietzschean here. So yeah, yeah, but um so wh where do I get back to? Oh so the, the happiness thing. Um and yeah, what you were saying about the yeah, yeah I, I lost what I was going to respond with because I was concentrating. Sorry. On you. But yeah. uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> the joy uh, that, yes. that we're talking about is that experiencing that, um, and I think he just wants you to experience it without the the extra layers of kind of contemplation of it. Like just mm -hmm. experience like a, a, a living like joy, like just enjoy it. I mean, without like evaluating so much, um, yeah. you know. But it seems to be where he's going with that. Um, oh, and that's, oh, that's, that's what I wanted to bring up is that I often say that about, uh, when people talk about masculinity, they make an argument like, well, what do we need it for? And that's that <laughs> utilitarianism. Well, what do we need it for? It, it, like, we don't need that today. Oh. And I'm like, is it, is it, a, a is my goal to be useful. A, a is my goal to be useful to you. Yeah. Uh, like that is that what I, I should be concerned? Or, oh, you don't need me to be yeah. what I am. Well, and that oh, okay. that th yeah. that uh, that line of reasoning is turtles all the way down because pick a pick an end that masculinity might be a means for. Yeah, and you can ask, well, what do you need that for? And you right. can you can go all the way down. At the, at the bottom of that is, what do you need to exist for? And you find yourself trying to justify your own existence to some objective standard of neutral yet purely good to be abstraction yeah. um and it's like I, I don't need to justify my own desires to you you know exactly which is uh, whoever whatever person <laughs> is asking this question yeah yeah 
It's yeah. like, I, I will embrace this and I will love my own goals here. And I might hold in a uh, connection to that love hatred for the uh, impediments to that. But I will, I will seek to transcend, you know, resentment and uh, complacency and this, this lazy soulless um, say satiety with uh pleasure i suppose yeah yeah well he, he said it wasn't he didn't mean to take our beer away so that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good uh, to be to be fair I, I i i i went to costco i'm like i'm gonna have a bigger bottle of gin in the in the, in the house i'm like I, i'm a grown-up i can have that and so i uh i had a so I had a gin and tonic before I walked the dogs. And that's when I thought, uh, when I decided I was going to do that big, like, big opening <laughs> like that. I was, I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, let's see. Uh, and the next one is also thorny. Because in it, what is what good is my reason? Does it mm. crave knowing as the lion craves its food? It is poverty and, and filth and wretched contentment. And, and so, like, that's, again, like, what is reason good for? You know, like, yes. is it is an interesting, and again, that's that's a difficult thing, you know. To, 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 you know it it can be impact. He speaks, yeah. and again, it's not in this book. I, I can't remember which book it's in, but he, he compares the will to truth to Egyptian youths perpetually pulling shrouds from statues. And he says, like, we should be less trustful of this will to truth. And I, I think he's, it's in line with his distrust of Christianity because he sees the bottom of this is a will to objective neutrality that is actually opposed to life. Because the, the self, the, the self affirmation of life is not neutral. And it is, it is opposed to that cold, clear-eyed kind of Dr. Manhattan aloofness that the will to truth sort of elevates. And um, there's, there's something self-hating in, the, there's a tension there, and there's something self-hating in the subjective being who embraces the will to objectivity too intensely, too thoroughly. And I think I think the 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 disgust for reason isn't necessarily a disgust for reason as a tool for resolving certain problems, but is a disgust of the the sort of deification of reason as some um, beautiful noble thing in itself, as some sort of ideal that humans should. Um, well, as you mentioned in uh, towards the end of the the closure of the book, uh, the the sort of um, Klingon or or worse Borg like um, model that we might try Vulcan. to mold ourselves into. Yes, Vulcan. Yes. Yeah. Vulcan. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Apollonianism is Vulcanism, basically. Yes. <laughs> you know, like um, yes. you know, like we feel no emotions because we are too. We we have it all figured out, and you know, yeah, yeah. And you can uh, tell I'm not that much of a trek. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I mean, that's about as much as I got. We have a couple guys in the group who are like deep in trekkies, but. Uh, uh, and, and, but, uh, no, I just know the basics, <laughs> but, right. uh, um, basically, so where this takes us to is, is uh, as far as what is the Ubermensch, you know, it paints a very different picture. Just talking about it for this long as, as to what most people think that that means. Yes. And, and you, you said earlier, obviously it was associated with, I don't dig too far into that. That was associated with Nazis for a long time. Cause um, I mean, I think it's pretty pretty well established that his sister was kind of, kind of took over his legacy, and she was uh, married to a guy who was doing all kinds of anti-Semitic stuff, and like uh, he was in he was in that in that pipeline, and uh, so yeah. it, 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 Nietzsche's work was kind of presented to those people, and da, 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 da. and and on the face of it, if you like you said, if you quote Nietzsche, it sounds like what they want that to be. You know, like the super, the uh, uh, beyond man, we're beyond, you know, like we're better than you. Yeah. Uh, you know, all these things. It sounds like where you want it to be when you talk about 
uh, master morality and slave morality and things that he talks about in his other books, it starts to look, it starts to sound like, and in parts it certainly does look like, uh, like, oh, this is about power. I uh, like, and, uh, and so I think, you know, when I was younger, I would read Nietzsche and think that's what I would get out of it. You know, and I think a lot, I think that's the case with a lot of people, but as you read it now, you're seeing something, we're seeing like a, something a lot different. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I mean, what you see in like the authoritarianism inherent of, in a, in like a, a fascist or a Nazi state is, um, much closer to that one herd thing right. than it is to this independent man in a garden creating order in his own little cottage universe which which seems to be much closer to what Nietzsche is describing as the as almost like the hermit who is creating his own little world um, yeah. as opposed to this uh like the, the Nazis seem a lot closer to the Borg <laughs> and, oh, and we see yeah. weird yeah. creepy parallels with the sort of neoliberal international uh, we're authoritarians, but we're not right, but we're not left either. Like, it, yeah. Well, I mean, that's yeah. After after you know the whole uh, it, it, the ongoing troubles uh, <laughs> since twenty twenty. Um, I mean, like, I, I'm always like, you saw a shift with certain people towards. I think just because of the woke stuff and whatever, you saw a shift with certain people towards like fascism and stuff. I'm like, you literally just lived through that. That's yeah. that's 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 what that looks like. That's how it feels. Uh, yeah. Like the, the people tell you where you can go and what you're allowed to do all the time. That's that's what that feels like. Um, and uh, no, no, thank you. And uh, obviously, Nietzsche would have been very much no thank you on that as well. Um, you know, he, he, he's very much a very much a free spirit. And I, I've said that you know anarchists claim him sometimes, and that's not wrong. Uh, like, you know, like it's it's close it's closer to that sometimes especially more the not like so much modern like person who calls himself an anarchist who just likes to wear like 1980s punk clothes or whatever they, they just but, go like, to music concerts yeah yeah, they, yeah <laughs> but, like the intellectual like uh max sterner or whatever like the the, the uh um the more intellectual like uh anarchists of like the early um 20th century and late 19th century uh but I could see Nietzsche being a little bit closer to that because uh, he doesn't like rules. <laughs> you know, uh, he doesn't like thou shalts for certain, certainly. Um, but this is where I get to like my problem with Nietzsche. Uh, I love this book and I think it's for me. <laughs> like I like uh, it, it's for people who think outside the box. A lot of it is provocation. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at what he's saying, he's like, you know, it's just shit like, like, what is your reason good for? And hey, what is your happiness? You know, like uh, a lot of it, and throughout the book, there's a lot of things that, you know, make you question ideas. I think it's a book for critical thinkers and a book, like actual critical thinkers, not people who took the class. But like uh, <laughs> actual critical thinkers who are like, wait, where does this come from? Why do we believe this? You know, and, uh, and you just want to look at it. And they're not going from the from the perspective of let's tear it down because we don't understand it. But the people being ready to be like, why do we really believe this? And do I believe this still? Or is it like yeah. who just want to examine ideas? And I think that that's right. what really this is good for. But if you look at... Uh, if we were to all, as far as how human societies work, as I often say, uh, if everyone's uh, the Ubermensch, then no one's taking out the garbage. Uh, because right. <laughs> it's it's not really a setup that, there's no plan. It's not like, it, well, like, I, as you say, like uh, Plato's Republic is not the plan, but it looks like one to some people. It's not a plan for the perfect world. Uh, yeah. Or the perfect society, the perfect city. It's actually it's very similar. Like in that. It's it's a it's a jarring invitation to think about things a little more deeply. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and, and so yeah, there's no plan here. So people are like, uh, I want to be a Nietzsche or whatever. They they, they want to be like, how, and, how do I live more like Nietzsche? And you're like, yeah. you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That's not what he wants you to you don't, do. Don't get it if you're asking. 
Yeah, you don't get it if you're asking. And so, like, it, it, it's it's a book for questioners, and that's why I love the subtitle for it, which is uh, a book for all and none. Uh, because it's not for everyone. It, it, it is for everyone, but it's not. You know, like, it's not, it's not a book that, like, here, take this, like, the Bible and spread it. Let's use this. Let's implement this. It, right. it, it, there's no there's no thing to implement it, it it's just uh like it's a book for questioners and and creators i think it, it's a book definitely a book for people who are creative yeah but but insofar as there is a difference in spirit between the the superman and the last man and not just for that individual but for everyone around them too mm -hmm. um i think there is something to be said for people you taking on a little bit of Nietzsche by degrees. I mean, you can, you can take on a little bit of that questioning attitude, become a little bit more curious, become a little bit more courageous in experimenting with your body, trying things and, and so forth. Then uh, you might ordinarily be, then you might be comfortable with get out of your comfort zone, so to speak. Don't be the, the, the last man saying, I'm comfortable here. I'm, I'm good right here. And I, I'm going to stay this way. Um, which is, is kind of an advanced ideal. And, and I, I've come to really dislike the people who think the most important political question is how do we get healthcare squared away? Like healthcare mm -hmm. policy, but that is a, like a real type that you'll see oh, in yeah. like political science discussions. It's like, how do we get more affordable health care? It's like, th that's your biggest concern. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, they, they've made everything small as, as he opened it with. Yeah. And to, to think a little bit bigger and you don't need to go full Elon Musk to do that. Uh, as you mentioned that, you know, someone's got to take out the trash. Well, if, if one guy is taking out the trash and he says, you know, I'm just following my route. What is, is there a way I could change my route to do it faster or more efficient? You can, you can begin to, to bring that curiosity and that thinking a little bigger, even to relatively small tasks. And um, people can become Nietzschean, I think. But we just, you just using that word after dismissing the use of that word, but, but by degrees, <laughs> you, know, you know, you can, you can bring that, that Superman energy, that spark of, life and creativity and thoughts and i'm gonna i'm gonna make something happen um energy <laughs> that be beyond, beyond human energy <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <B -H -E>. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of monster gold energy yeah. yeah yeah well i mean i mean i think you're probably more generous fellow than i am in that case but like uh in, in terms of like i think that well, I, I do think actually men like to be active participants of things. I think a lot of men actually, I mean, I am the last man when I get in a car. <laughs> I am la like, Lucio has like said before, like, like I will get in the same lane at the same time every day, <laughs> like to go to the same place. Like, whereas like, like uh, the guy I live with, like uh, he will, I'll, I'll go down this road and see where it leads. I'll go down this yeah. road and see where it leads. Like, I don't know if I maybe find a different way. I'll go this way today. Whatever. Like, I'm like. <laughs> well, to, that, to that end, um, our mutual friend, um, Johnny Manaz. Yeah. Uh, mentioned in one of his books. I don't I think it's the King's Curriculum. Talking about how uh, one of the ways to uh, get yourself into a different mental gear. Right. Is to. Uh, one technique, and he recommended blending a few different techniques, is to, to take a different path home than you normally would, to drive a different route. And to, um, I think the, the last man sort of wants to find that, to find the optimal route and just do that. Right. And like, we all have our things where we, we do that in one domain so that we can focus our energy somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. You know, cause if we're always having to find new lanes on the road, then we might not have energy to get home and write or be there for our kids or yeah. redesign the living room or whatever. But as a, as a general tendency, do you, which, which do you default to if you're bored, which do you do, you know? Um, and, and then do you just go to, you know, 
drugs and alcohol and porn when you have free time or do you try to like make things happen um and uh like that that can be done in very mundane ways um and and i think what he's concerned about is the idealization the, the of the last man's preferences as opposed to the idealization of the overman's preferences right just a just a guess because that the idealization of the overman's preferences obviously puts elon musk at like the the high end he's literally close to literal superman in terms of like leaving this you earth. know I, it's but, funny uh, we did not we did not pre-discuss that but actually i was going to open with that because that's the kind of stuff <laughs> i i just forgot but like yeah. that's, that's the way a lot of you know, a lot of people like to hear because that's like like is elon musk the superman like we, we yeah. it, it, well, like he's funny I, I, because i was thinking about it, i'm like at first i was like i was like uh, if if Tate wasn't theoretically Muslim, that would also be a good argument for an Ubermensch in terms of like does not apologize for wanting the things that he wants. He's and got do, that and doing what he needs to get them. Yeah, you know, like uh, whereas, but I think Elon Musk is a little bit better. But, but you know, like the Muslim thing kind of puts a wrench in that because then that's yeah, that's well, that's going back to the 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 thing that that precedes the uh, last man, but the. Uh, <laughs> When it comes to Elon Musk, yeah, I mean, it's that def that's a man who wants to do some things, and he has some ideas and wants to do some things, and he's really not letting people get in his way. No, and he, he he's not really <laughs> apologizing for any of them, but is also being very human. I mean, he's like make babies, do that, you know, like uh, yeah. there's a lot of elements about him that are that are very uh, Nietzsche in that sense. Yeah. And, and you know, you could that there are many people who say, with good reason. Uh, they uh, that he seems to be kind of a transhumanist in some ways but yeah. he, if he is a transhumanism his seems to be a trans the transhumanism the incidental transhumanism of an engineer who's yeah. just trying to solve problems and do things it doesn't seem to begin with a disgust towards the the limitations of mankind and of the body um so it's 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 got that that subtle but perhaps important difference in motivation that that gives it a different character to all of the the technologies and the things he's doing i, I don't know if there's a case that for putting chips in human brains is not transhumanist to some degree but um yeah i mean that's know. definitely like walking a thin line but i mean uh that's that's one of the things that they've you know if you're talking to transhumanists that seem like that don't seem like they're possessed by a resentment and the hatred of the body that they want to kill us all. Uh, cause there are people who are working on things like that. Like I'm going to cure cancer or, I mean, I know, I know a guy actually on, on uh, X, I think he actually lives in Arizona. Who's a, uh, he, he's, he's working on AI to cure cancer. Like that's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's people who are doing things with that. I, I mean, I'm always like, well, it might do that, but also do some other bad things. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, there's people who are working on with those goals, and the same of like, uh, you know, work. You know, do you hate the idea of people having eye, eye implants? You know, like that would uh, well, give them vision. Well, or I mean, like, I mean, this is like kind of this is this kind of Mont and Bailey that people do, where yeah, they'll, they'll, exactly. they'll fall back on. Well, well, don't you like all this medical technology that we used to save through human lives? So yeah, like, that's not <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's not what that is you know? well, it's not the, the it's not the the strain of transfusion is that we're talking about like it, it's not the uh yeah. it, it, there's there's people who would call that transhumanism who call themselves transhumanism who would actually have good things to say and then there's yeah. what we see in the word in the etymology of, of transhumanism well, and, and and that we're like wait what that means there is right, a yeah. there is an interesting philosophical question about like at what point, like a ship of Theseus problem, at right. what point of replacing natural bodily functions with augmenting technology, do we cease to be human in the way that our ancestors were human? And that's a, that's a philosophical question that applies to all technology. Like, right. are we a different species now that we have smartphones than our great, great grandparents were who did not even have phones, period? Right. I don't know. We're probably the same species. I think we could cross-populate, you know. But like, 
I, I think I think as like, long as you can cross populate, it's still yeah. Good. That's that's but, how that works. But but that like notwithstanding, it's an interesting question. Yeah. But transhumanism is not just asking that question. There's a line beyond which we are hypothetically no longer Homo sapiens, and right. we become post humans. Right. And transhumanism is, I think, the best word to describe. Transhumanism it. is not just let's use technology to make our lives better. Transhumanism yeah. is not trying to solve a particular problem, but to become post human. It's right. to find where that line is and cross it. And that is not what an engineer is trying to do. That's not right. what these medical R&D people are trying to do. And right. the transhumanist apologists will blur that and pretend like these are the same things and these are the same motivations, and they're not. Um, yeah. And, and then they'll say the quiet part out loud and say, like, we're going to make we're going to make God and your children and children worship it. You right. know, like, a, yeah. yeah, like that kind of shit that comes out of their mouths a lot. And that's, you know, like that it shows it reveals their intentions in that in that in that. And like, like we've said in, in several times in this conversation, the intent is a big part of the difference. Yeah. Between these two things. And, and uh, you know, the, the intent to destroy humanity and transcend it. Another thing, you know, uh, we're, we're going to end it there because we don't want to get too far into transhumanism. Because, we're, <laughs> because well, that's, again, it's, it's a fixation right now. But well, uh, I mean, we're, we are talking about the, the Superman, which, yeah, yeah. you know, but I believed up until like a few weeks ago was the accidental antecedent to transhumanism so right um, it's been very therapeutic for me to work through it again <laughs> in my in my salvation of nietzsche from my own conception of him yeah 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 it's it's not yeah anyway it's yeah i forget what i was gonna say before we <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> i was gonna i was gonna wrap up the transhumanism in, in, in some way but uh it, yeah it's um the long and short of it is the superman is not identical with to the like the desire to overcome man as a biological being right oh it's, okay now i got now i got where i was going is that there's a thing that people do ever since darwin um the concept of evolution which is a thing that happens in theory because it happens by itself it doesn't it's not human directed and there's a thing that the people have done ever since that the, that they the theory of evolution became popular is that they will confuse proximate and ultimate causes mm. in the, in the idea that we need to serve evolution. Well, you do anyway. It, it, that's how it works. It works. It works. It, it, you don't, you don't consciously get involved in evolution. It does its own thing. Um, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm not going to say that uh, we don't have to get into that, but uh, the, the idea that the, uh, uh, eugenics is not uh, the worst idea in the world. It makes a good big sense. And so you, I could see that kind of evolution going, you know, but uh, at the same time, um, where they're talking about is transhumanism is they feel like they're taking us to the next step of evolution and right. it's their work to do that. And yes. that's not how evolution works. <laughs> you it's know, like that it's not your conscious yeah. job to drive evolution. It's a it's a argumentative slate of hand that um, James Lizzie, our our other uh, <laughs> character here, yeah. is is uh, very fond of pointing out. In certain people, it's like, oh, there are these processes that happen in history, so we can either let them play out subcon unconsciously, or we can let the people who understand these processes um, control them consciously. And if we consciously control it, that's just presumed to be better never mind and this is like the problems with like eugenics programs as opposed to eugenics in, in the broader sense uh it's like as soon as you try to systematize it you have to ignore certain variables like right. the systematization neglects factors almost axiomatically and so like as soon as you conscientize a process you kind of corrupt it I mean, there's the corruption of power uh, that, that's also at work when you put an administrative class in charge of something, which is right. usually not that, I think to that's do that. where the problem happens is the administrative yeah. class getting involved in that. If you just say, if you just like naturally, which kind of happens, uh, you know, pretty rich athletic people marry pretty rich athletic people. That's yeah. that's eugenics. Uh, but uh, it's, it, not, it, it's if not we true. were to 
if we were to go back in time and tell Nietzsche that, uh, by the way, uh, the Olympic Games yeah. are uh, it's a several week sex festival by the most athletic and attractive people in the world prior yeah. to some games to entertain the rest of the world. I think he would be very happy with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's probably one of the better. <laughs> Those people should probably breed. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. not a bad. It's not a bad thing. Although they probably all have. Did they actually bring these children to fruition? Because probably that would, not. That would be that would be uh, contrary to their athletic goals, wouldn't it? <laughs> so probably. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's that, that, that's a. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but uh, but anyway. Nice, I, nice. We have, we have one comment. Our, uh, our, our guy who gave our, us our beer back uh, was <laughs> Mc, McDubus. Uh, he said that he's a tech guy, tech guy, and you know his goal is to automate everything. But it is a you know road to hell to pay with good intentions. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, like in the way that like I have fun making uh, AI. I it's not art. It's just it's like images that are useful um, that I'm not really making. I'm um, just, uh, but uh, I have fun with that. But it also, before that got invented, uh, I was planning on learning how to draw again. Uh, <laughs> you know, and now I'm just like, who has time? And I need a million images every day. And, uh, you know, like I can't, no one can keep up with that. Uh, so, um, and how can I compete with this thing? You know, like uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not saying that that can't happen. Uh, or I would like to, if someday I can make enough money doing this kind of stuff that I could actually have time to draw, that would be cool. Um, well, no. that, we're, we're talking about Nietzsche specifically, so we can talk about him broadly too, right? Yeah. Nietzsche also um, talked about the the aristocracy and the the habits of the aristocracy being defined almost by their peacocking, their, their unnecessary. That's why the aristocrats had expansive lawns. And he said, yeah. in the future where we won't need to buy or sell, perhaps the act of bartering and buying and selling will become an aristocratic pastime. That will be like, because it's unnecessary, because we don't need to hunt foxes for food or to protect our geese or whatever, uh, the aristocrats will all be, make a thing of fox hunting. And maybe now that we all have AI art to do our art for us, uh, People will learn to to draw as a flex, uh, you know. Uh, I, I think that's already happening. I mean, I think that there's going to be a, a little bit of flex in the way that I was going to make a post about today, and I thought better about it. Uh, it's not I'm out of my lane, it where it felt like it. But uh, in terms of a lot of the AI stuff, whether it's writing or whatever, is kind of becoming like you know being a soldier and called it Call of Duty. You know, like uh, in the sense of like, well, what can you actually do? Because mm. you spend a lot of time getting good at doing this thing that isn't the thing that you're doing. Uh, but it, you're, you're it, yes. but instead of like, well, oh, well, you know a lot about guns, but you've literally never fired one except for like, but we're going, you know, like stuff like that. Like how much of a real thing, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, that, that's a problem that that's creating, uh, but it's also creating like a, Oh, you can do a real thing. Like, <laughs> like you can yeah. do a real, you can make a real art. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting flex for some people, you know, like it's just inefficient and slow, but uh, um, it is, it, I think that that's happening already. Yeah. But as guns are, you know, uh, becoming more, you know, video game fied and people are living that out vicariously instead of going hunting, yeah, you have our aristocrats like Lana Del Rey posting a selfie, a selfie holding a pistol, uh, like last week, and Post Malone is taking gun courses with Grand Thumb. Oh, he's so, been deep into that for years. Oh yeah, he's he's like yeah. hardcore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's <laughs> out been, there in like full kit battle rig. And oh yeah, yeah. he's been doing that for years. I like it because he was doing it through a couple people that I used to know, and, uh, and all of a sudden they're like going to Post Malone concerts because they're like they're his gun trainers. Uh, but uh, did, you know, I mean, that's happened Jordan a lot. Peterson get a picture taken of him shooting with like night vision at a range in Texas, and Elon Musk sure. was shooting a fifty cal from the shoulder or something. Yeah, I, I'm like, sure they all get tons. Of, who doesn't want to take those guys? I mean, in the same way, I used to get a lot of invites to go to uh, and do occasionally uh, to to go train with people. 
they all like they read your book or whatever they want to they're like here i i can shoot, teach you how to shoot or do something like that you know so i've i've definitely had that experience uh with people too so i mean i can only imagine their inbox is full of like the, the best of the best be like i want to be the guy who trained jordan peterson you know like they yeah. of course i mean it's it's out there for them whenever they want it but one thing i wanted to wrap up with just because you brought it up and, and it dovetails with this is and I saw it briefly because I think it was in Genealogy and Morals where he talks about some of the stuff that you're talking about a little bit, like the classes, because I just picked it up right before we started. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this is where it dovetails with another book that I've written a lot about in the past, which is Theory of the Leisure Class. Mm -hmm. And that's a that, that's an interesting one because they were like, well, the leisure ca class came to power, um, you know, on things on violent causes. You know, they 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 everywhere in the world. The leisure class originally, you know, were were warrior kings, who came the, the people who made the noble men noble uh, back in the day. Now, not so much today. Our new noble class, the nouveau riche, not so much. But uh, they got you know rich from typing. But uh, the the old classes, the the old money comes from people who did some conquering at some point, but yeah. they don't need to conquer anymore. So they're but they're all their regalia. Is, is festooned with these things of, of like hunting and whatever. And we don't see it as much in America, but you know, in, in especially one of our members that was telling me one time, like uh, in England, you know, hunting is posh. That's what the noble class does. That's not for regular people uh, because it's always been the King's land. And like, it's for the nobleman's class. They go hunting, you don't go hunting. And so hunting was for the thing that the wealthy did you know, after the farmers actually get food, but we just go hunt because it's something that was is is of our class that we've we've always done this. So now you don't get to do it; we get to do it, and right. so it's very much a. I think it's happening; it's becoming that way more in America. But it is a uh, um, very much that that same mentality that you're talking about, as far as like I said, that's where it kind of dovetails. Like, what's the what do the wealthy people do, and what's their flex, and what, where does it come from? Mick Tubis says. Laughs in 1776. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, 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 I'm waiting for it to happen. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, guys, uh, we, we should probably get going here. Uh, uh, but uh, it was funny. We, we were like barely into the discussion when it hit the hour mark. I was like, we have so much more to unpack about this. <laughs> it's uh, a very, I mean, he's such a dense writer and we could probably spend another hour uh, if we wanted to tying yeah. in with this uh you know connection to the earth with this lord of the earth archetype in you know fire in the dark which is not normally the archetype you would associate with the overman it would be more like the father right um but um there's there's a lot to there's still a lot to unpack and and i, I think as nietzsche himself said in in one of his aphorism books it's like every sentence should take you some like you know minutes if not hours to unpack and think through and translate into uh <laughs> yeah if you're if you're writing blood and aphorisms uh but uh it, it's uh yeah he there, there's a lot there that's why i love the, the writing and parables and so forth uh that he did but mm -hmm. uh um yeah there's there's a lot more I, we, we've been reading it we're a fire and i'm just like we'll read five sections then we'll read the next five sections and i don't think we're going to go through the whole book because we take the rest of the year yeah. uh it, or we're very very near it you know like in a six months and we want to read other things too but uh I wanted to give them an introduction to some of these basic uh, ideas because uh, I think they're so important. But uh, anyway, um, that said, we should we should wrap this part up because, like you said, there's a lot more we could go into forever and ever. And yeah, you know, maybe we'll do more pod, uh, podcasts on Nietzsche, like pepper them throughout so people don't get bored with me talking about Nietzsche. But uh, <laughs> uh, we'll definitely do it a lot more in, in the future throughout uh, as we're doing the show. But anyway, thanks, guys, uh, for uh, commenting. And uh, thanks for telling us we had a good discussion. I never know. We, we, we're we trying. And uh, and uh, all of you, like, you know, like and subscribe. And uh, other than that, uh, see you later. Stay solar. Stay solar.